we've been learning a lot about sharks and shark tracking devices, so we decided to take a trip down to Cal State Long Beach to interview some scientists in the shark lab. Let's go. Welcome to the Shark Lab. I'm Dr. Chris Lowe. I'm a professor of marine biology and I'm the director here. And these are two of my students, Sarah Luongo and Emily Meese. So this is where the magic happens. This is where we get to do research on sharks and other game fish. The Shark Lab has been here since 1969. It's one of the oldest shark labs in the country. So one question I have is how do scientists research sharks in the field? So we use a lot of different technologies to um, research sharks in the field. Um, most of them have to do with where sharks are going and why, right? So there's a few different ways we can do that. There's two types of tracking that we do, active and passive. So when we're talking about acoustic telemetry, that's when we have a tag in the shark that emits sound waves. And these sound waves a really, really high frequency. They're higher than our hearing, they're higher than the fish's hearing. Um, they're about 69 kilohertz. And the tag emits a frequency and transmits to a hydrophone. This is a hydrophone that would be down on the seafloor that's passively listening for tags to come by. So as the shark passes by this hydrophone, its tag is emitting a sound wave that the hydrophone picks up. So that's passively collecting data, because it's just out there sitting. Another way using acoustic telemetry is to actively track the shark. We have somebody in a boat with another hydrophone, very similar, listening for sound waves. As the shark is swimming, this hydrophone is following the tag around, trying to get the highest decibels, or the highest power that the tag is letting out. So we can actively follow the shark around from the boat. Another type of um, tag that we use, instead of acoustic sound waves, is radio waves. Radio waves don't transmit through water. Usually these tags are put on the shark's dorsal fin. The dorsal fin has to break the surface so that the antenna is out of the water so that the radio wave can transmit through the air. And that goes to either somebody in the boat that's listening for it or a satellite. Why do you still use radio waves? The shark has to break the surface for it to transmit. That's a great question. So the acoustic and telemetry, the passive and the active tracking, is really limited to where we can have these receivers and the range on the receivers. So some white sharks that are really large can swim all the way to Hawaii. Well, we don't have these sitting on the floor all the way to Hawaii, and we can't just take a boat and follow it there. So we need some other forms of tags that can still give us data. So this is called a spot tag. This gets bolted to the shark's dorsal fin. So it's on the shark's dorsal fin, the shark's swimming, and when the shark comes up to the surface, it breaks the surface of the water, this will send a signal to the antenna and we have an exact GPS location for the shark. And it was originally, you know, when people first started doing this, we weren't sure, you know, how often do sharks come to the surface. They actually go to the surface quite a bit, and we've been able to get some really awesome data, movement data from this. So that's one reason why we use these. And then another form of radio waves that we use is called a pat tag. So this is um, put on the shark, usually um, darted onto the shark's back, and it hangs just along the side, just under the dorsal fin. And this is collecting light intensity, temperature, and depth. And this will stay on the shark, depending on how well it gets on there, a couple years to a couple months. And this will eventually pop up, float to the surface, and all of the data that it recorded will transmit to a satellite. And then we can know how deep that shark was going, what temperatures it was in, and we can try to figure out where that shark went. Another way we use radio tags is with this really cool thing. So this is our shark backpack. There's a lot of things on it that kind of combine a whole bunch of different technologies. So there's a video camera. We can see exactly what the shark's doing. There's an acoustic tag. So this is the one that we'll actually sit in a boat and follow with those acoustic water um, sound waves, right? We'll follow them through the boat. 
at the end of 24 hours, there's a link here that will dissolve, and it'll, this will pop up and float to the surface. So that's how we get all of this data back, right? the video camera, everything like that. But now this sound tag, right, the acoustic tag, is no longer in the water, so we now need a radio tag, which is in here with this antenna. Now that it's floating on the surface, we need a radio tag in order to find this to get it back and download all the data. So radio tags can actually be really important, even though they only transmit through there. Oh, wait, wait, wait. I'm confused. I don't get about acoustic or radio waves. Why not choose one of them? So the reason that we have to use both acoustic and radio tags all depends on, one, where the shark is and where that tag is that we put in or on the shark. So sharks live in the water, right? So first things first, we have to deal with acoustic um, sound waves, which are kind of slower and larger and more powerful waves that are able to push through water. Um, especially salt water, because salt water has really concentrated solutes and salts in it, right? That's why it gets the same salt water. These acoustic waves that are typically around 69 kilohertz frequency are able to push through that water medium. These waves can't travel up through air. They kind of want something to be able to push through and move through for us to get that signal. When a shark breaks the surface, we then are able to get some interesting data via um, radio waves, right? And this works well for sharks that travel really long distances that we're just not able to follow and keep up with acoustically. So that's why we use radio waves that transmits to satellites. We're able to get that information from wherever they go. So radio waves are tighter, right? If you look at the differences, there's definitely, you can definitely see that they're different. They're tighter, they're faster, and they're a little bit more vibrant than um, acoustic waves. So radio waves are able to travel through air because although there are some things in the air, air is a gas environment, right? So it's more spread out. It's a much clearer path for a wave like this to travel through. Whereas a wave like this in the water, in salt water with all those solutes, those solutes just act as a break to those waves and they just don't transmit through the water. So we did an experiment in school and so we tried it out with salt water and fresh water and they're both water but it seemed to work less in salt water than it did in fresh water. Yes, and that's because radio waves in salt water, all the salt ions are attenuating the signal and they're blocking the signal. Where in fresh water, there's much less ions to block the signal so it can go farther. Here's our acoustic tag, right? We talked about this. And here's a hydrophone, right? So this is what picks up the tag and you can hear like, right? So any, anything it hears, we should hear. And then this travels back to the receiver and kind of converts this really high frequency that we can't hear right now into one that we can't hear. Okay, and that's given to us in decibels. So what we can do is see at what point, so do you hear that clicking? Yeah. So it works, right? So why don't you take this and take it away from me? Slowly, slowly. What did you notice? It got quieter, quieter right? And if I back up, you can't even hear it, right? So now what I want you to do is hold that in the water. Tag in there, tag us in one. There you go. Are you ready? So what do you guys think is happening? It's the radio waves are making it louder. Which waves? The the uh acoustic waves. Acoustic waves are acoustic waves, 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 right? So go ahead and take this and walk it around anywhere you want to go on the tank. Keep it in the water. And it's still pretty loud, it's still pretty consistent, right? because those acoustic waves are able to travel much better in water than they just did in air, right? So now keep the hydrophone in and take the tag out. Nothing, right? So that tag is not able to go through the water and the hydrophone is just waiting to hear something for the water. So this is what happens when that tag now pops off the shark and we now have to hear it. So then what do we have to use? Radio. Radio. Radio wave. So we're gonna switch out receivers. So now that the tag's popped out of the water, we want to get it back to download all the other data that it's been recording, right? So this is when we use our radio receiver for our radio transmitter, right? Do you hear that little clicking? A little tweet almost? Mm -hmm. That's how we can hear radio waves up in the air. Put the tag back in the water. Nothing, right? So it only travels through the air. But if we had the water hydrophone for the acoustic hydrophone in the water, we could still get the tag, right? So that's why we have to use two different methods, but both are really valuable to us in order to get a tag back. Hmm? When you're in the field,
field, what does that look like? So it depends. So on a, on a good field day, we might leave the dock at 6 a.m. We might not be back till 6 p.m. And then, of course, gear needs to be cleaned up. Data needs to be backed up to computers. So usually, sometimes people aren't out of here till 10 or 11 o'clock at night. Then we get up at 5 or 6 o'clock and do it again the next day. But it's fun. You're in the field. You're doing cool things. So it's exhausting, but it's rewarding. All my students each have a different project, some of which are working on different species, or not just sharks, but other game fish. So some days we're out in a boat five miles offshore. Other days we go to Catalina Island. Some days we're tromping around the mud in the estuaries or the, or the marshes. So it all depends on what project needs help that day. So in many ways, my job is to help support them, give them the tools and the training they need so that they can accomplish their projects. But it's really up to them. They get to make mistakes and have to do things over, and that's how you learn. I have a question. What do you hmm? look for, what do you look for, for students that want to help with the shark bite? Yeah, so that's a really good question. So, you know, in the old days, marine biologists were usually people that love to get in the field. They love to get in the water. They love to handle animals, catch animals, and learn about animals. But the game is changing. Now, the next step, what we need to do to learn the next thing about animals requires technology. So that technology requires an understanding of how technology works. So a little bit of understanding about engineering. But because with this new technology enables us to gather huge amounts of data, I'm also looking for students that know how to handle lots of data. So that requires a little computing experience if you know how to program or code. Because literally in a period of a month, we could have 8 million lines of data. So you can't just manage that in something like Excel. You have to be able to write code so that you can do what we call ripping and stripping, pulling out the important parts of the data and getting rid of the parts that aren't so important. So I look for people that have good math backgrounds, interest in computer science, interest in engineering, love to get in the field, love to work long, hard hours, love to dive, love to drive boats. That's what I'm looking for. That's the next generation of biology student. Mm -hmm. um, what's the most rewarding thing about all the research? You know, the most rewarding thing for me when I do research is to be able to do something where I'm answering a, a science question, a biological question, which just for science sake is really important, but to have that science be applicable for something. Like, for example, improving a fishery so that people can keep fishing and catching fish to eat so that the next generation will be able to do that. When I get to do science that helps with that, that makes me feel good about what I get to do. So not only do I get the joy of discovering something new, but I'm hopefully doing some science that's going to help society. The other part that's really, this is probably the most rewarding part, is training students. So my greatest contributions to science won't be the science that I do. It will be the students that I produce. It will be the science that they do. That will probably be my greatest contribution. So finding that next great student that I can train and watch them go on and do great things, that is very satisfying. So thank you so much for inviting us to your lab and opening up to us and sharing your knowledge. And we cannot wait to tell you what we learned today. Thank you guys. It was nice meeting you. You too. <laughs>